So welcome everyone uh, to the, the microstructure exchange. Uh, today we, uh, uh, we have uh, Stefan Sharnowski uh, from Mannheim, who is uh, presenting uh, the paper, A Tale of Two Cities, uh, Intermarket Latency and Fast Trader Competition. And uh, uh, before we begin, um, let me repeat what uh, we uh, said uh, last time, that we, uh, we have some new uh, security features uh, here at uh, TME because of an incident uh, before the summer uh, where the meeting was uh, uh, hijacked, or at least the, the whiteboard. Uh, so um, uh, if you want to ask questions, uh, we will need to unmute, allow you to unmute before you can unmute. Uh, so uh, if you have a question, use the, the raise hand uh, function and uh, then uh, we will allow you to unmute. And then uh, if you mute again, then we need to allow you to unmute uh, again. So then uh, indicate somehow if you want to, to speak up again. Um, I just asked uh, Stefan and uh, uh, he will have uh, some dedicated question breaks. Uh, if and and then uh, we can uh, uh, if you have questions in the meantime you can put them in the chat um, maybe uh, I see Christian is here and maybe he will respond in the chat and we can also elevate the the question if suitable uh, during the question break and then we will have a Q and A after uh, after the talk uh, as usual. Also, uh, before we begin, uh, we have uh, the next uh, talk in two weeks from now, and uh, uh, that is the time when uh, uh, Europe has uh, changed uh, the daylight saving uh, and the US has not. So that means that for us Europeans uh, who usually come here at 5 p.m., uh, in two weeks we are going to come here at 4 p.m. instead. So uh, uh, pay attention to that. If you subscribe to our uh, Google Calendar, then it will show up there automatically, of course. Uh, I think uh, that is the, all the announcements for today. So uh, Stefan, take it away. All right. Thank you. Thank you for having me and letting me present this paper, which is joint work with uh, Sachet, who is now at NASDAQ. Um, Eric, who's also in Mannheim, and Christian, who is not only in Vienna, but also um, here in this meeting. So he will also um, jump in if there are any uh, questions that you may ask, uh, for example, in the chat. So this paper um, is set in the well modern trading landscape that we're faced with nowadays of fast fragmented market. Um, we have uh, markets that are geographically dispersed, not just in the US, but also um, in Europe, where we have trading venues where you can trade um, related or even the same assets in well, different places that are located, um, well, in our case here across um, Europe. Take that together with another trend that we've had over the past, well, decades or ever since we've had financial markets, really, and that is that trading speed is important when it comes to um, when it comes to uh, market outcomes. That can be in the context of just a single trading venue. Um, so typically, in those cases, we look at infrastructure upgrades to individual exchanges. In the case of uh, in the case of colocation, for example, where traders want to move their servers as close to the matching engine of the exchange as possible, leading to within venue competition on the speed dimension. But with fragmented markets, we also have another dimension where trading speed matters, of course, and that is intermarket latency. So traders want to be as fast as possible to transmit a signal or market information or any kind of information from one trading venue to the other, leading to cross venue competition in that speed dimension. And in that case, more so than in the collocation in the within venue competition case, capacity constraints that traders have um, when it comes to you know, transmitting these signals from one market to the other are typically binding and very important. In any case, be that within venue or across venues, what typically matters is not so much the absolute speed that we're talking about, but the speed differences across different traders that we have. And um, our paper wants to answer the question of how Intermarket latency, so this um, across venue dimension of this competition for speed, um, how does intermarket latency among high frequency traders and the fastest bunch of high frequency traders 
impact market integration, liquidity, and other dimensions of market quality, like volatility and price efficiency, for example. We're going to do this by exploiting the introduction of the first commercially available microwave link between London and Frankfurt. This happened um, some years ago in October 2012. And what is important here is that this was the first commercially available microwave link. This link that was, uh, was introduced in October of that year had a limited capacity as we usually have when it comes to um, connecting different trading venues. Um, in that case, an individual subscriber would get a capacity of about 10 megabit per second. I'll come back to this number a bit later on and had capacity at this bandwidth for 12 subscribers. Now, after this link was introduced, the um, company mentions that the capacity that they um, had on that microwave link sold out within a month. So there was a bit of a time gap for everybody to subscribe, subscribe and set up the trading operations on this microwave link. Uh, but within a month, all of that was pretty much, um, pretty much done. Now you as a subscriber to that microwave link or as anybody who would operate a microwave link between London and Frankfurt, you have a speed advantage over somebody who only trades on fiber optics, which is basically the alternative to operating a microwave network. In fiber optics, you have a um, one-way latency to transmit a signal from one venue to the other of about uh, 4.2 milliseconds. And with a microwave network, that is about half that. And it's pretty close to the speed of light at that distance of about two milliseconds. Just to compare this to something that, um, to, to put this in, in perspective, the human reaction time to a visual stimulus is about 200, sometimes 300 uh, milliseconds. So of course, things here are really, really fast. Now, that's the first commercially available microwave link, which means that before the introduction of that link, there were other proprietary microwave links available between Frankfurt and London, but only very few of them. It's difficult to come up with an exact number of how many of these private networks there were before this, um, um, this new commercially available link that you could subscribe to were introduced. But you know, some numbers based on news announcements that we found, it's like two or three maybe. Um, in any case, it's a very limited number of people that had their own microwave network um, compared to this kind of introduction where you now have 12 new players that subscribe to this, uh, to this link. Should also say that at least initially um, among those that subscribed to the link, those were traders and not data vendors. So it's not like um, in the sample that we're looking at, somebody would um, you know, just sell market information that was transmitted via this microwave link. That happened, but a bit later, um, so not during this uh, kind of October period that we're uh, that we're studying in our sample here. Now, don't, why do we look at these two uh, these two markets? We want to compare German stocks to French stocks, and the interesting thing is that um, French stocks, at least during our sample, were trading in London. So, Euronext Paris had their data center uh, moved to Basel, which is close to London. And then, well, basically on the other side of London, you have uh, Slow, where you have the data center of Chiax, where you can also trade French stocks, but not only French stocks, but you can also trade German stocks um, at Chiax, but they also, of course, trade in uh, Frankfurt on et cetera. So that gives us a kind of a treatment group, which is German stocks that trade in Frankfurt and New London. And we have a control group um, that is French stocks that trade, oddly enough, in well, London for both cases for Euronext Paris and Slow. I mean, later on, I think like two years ago, Euronext again moved their um, data center, now they're in Italy. But um, and back then, um, all of the kind of French trading on these two venues was happening in London. Now, this introduction of the microwave link, um, as I've said, there were some networks likely before, so some people were trading very fast. Um, between these two trading menus, but with the introduction, we now have an increase in the number of really, really fast traders. The Perseus Telecom here kind of claim that they were the fastest. There's not really any empirical evidence that they were um, the fastest, but in any case, the speed differences between different networks um, compared to trading on fiber optics were typical, were likely very small, um, especially uh, when you in addition, you consider these capacity constraints that you have on microwave networks, but I will get back to um, that in a little bit. So I want to give you a very brief preview of our results, but only very briefly, um, because I think they will make a bit more sense once I've covered kind of our hypothesis development. So what we do find in a nutshell is that 
the effect of this upgrade to intermarket latency or this decrease in intermarket latency for more traders than before depends on the environment where this is happening, in particular, the characteristics of the stock or the market dynamics surrounding an individual um, asset. So in our case here, we study a relatively broad cross-section of different um, stocks and look at the impact of the introduction of that microwave link on this cross-section. We find some nuanced effects that depend on um, which stock we're actually looking at. In our case, we do a basically sample split in mid caps and large caps, um, and we do find some nuanced effects there. So overall, across all stocks, we find that the introduction of the link actually does matter. So the, there are fewer arbitrage opportunities. Stock-specific information becomes more relevant compared to market-wide information. We find that um, you know, price discovery happens more often at the uh, JX, at least for mid-cap. So the, the introduction of the link matters along these dimensions. But when we look at liquidity, and um, other measures of market quality, we find that most of the positive effects come from mid caps. We're likely market making by very fast traders was not all that competitive before the introduction of this new link. And some of the more negative effects that we see associated with the introduction of that link are happening in large caps. So in particular, we find a positive effect um, on liquidity of mid caps and a negative effect on liquidity of, of large caps. We also find some differences when it comes to reductions of volatility, which is really only happening in mid caps and not so much in large caps, and some changes in price efficiency um, that are similar to the improvements in liquidity that we find for mid caps, but um, not so much for large caps. So to kind of summarize all of these results that I'm going to show, um, show later on, there are these nuanced effects, and um, it really depends on kind of the competitive environment uh, surrounding market makers when it comes to the um, effect of the introduction of this new link, which decreased um, intermarket latency. And it kind of makes sense that we find these you know, nuanced effects that differ in the cross-section of the assets that we have, because when we look at the literature, a lot of the work that we have does find diverging results, depending on exactly what kind of effect of HFT we're looking at and what kind of market we're looking at and how we view HFT in general. So in theoretical studies, a lot of the work that we have looks at a single market setting. So you know, empirically, that would then map to something like a co-location upgrade. Um, we have a lot of work there. A bit less when it comes to um, models that include multiple trading venues. Some of the studies that um, look at multiple trading venues, they look explicitly at the kind of competition between trading venues. And we have a little bit to say on that, but this really is not the focus um, of our paper. But then we also have some models that look at cross-market trading and arbitrage trading. And this really is along the lines of what we're doing. Um, so I will um, you know, talk a lot more about uh, Joseph um, JF paper from 2020, uh, because I think this really comes closest to kind of our empirical setting. When we look at the empirical evidence that we have, um, a lot of this also comes from single markets. Again, these are oftentimes co-location introductions or upgrades to existing co-location systems. There are some papers, but few of them, that look at an intermarket setting with the shock to intermarket um, latency. Um, we have this uh, paper by uh, Kalan and GB and Tom that um, also looks at a shock to intermarket latency and focuses on effects of um, you know, non-toxic and toxic arbitrage and how that impacts uh, liquidity. Um, during these you know, shocks to intermarket latency. And of course, you can't say um, microstructure and microwaves in one sentence without also mentioning Andres and Constantine's uh, cool paper on these weather interruptions when it comes to a microwave link between Chicago and, uh, and New York, um, using this kind of switching on and off of high frequency trading as a shock to better understand the impact of um, changes in intermarket latency. Well, Given this kind of lag that we have when it comes to um, you know, intermarket latency shocks and the cross-section of different assets, uh, this is really where we see our, um, our contribution here. So we present some evidence that makes use of this cross-section that we um, have. Where we have stocks that you know, span a wide range of uh, different liquidity regimes. We have different um, participation of, of HFTs. Um, and 
we have some studies that suggest that the effects of HFT really depend on some characteristics or maybe kind of the market implications that come from different from characteristics like size, that leads to maybe higher trading volume and so forth. Um, the cross-section um, of stocks that we have likely differs with respect to the prior involvement of HFTs. As I mentioned, there were likely some, um, there were some few microwave networks before, um, and this has implications for the competitiveness of market making. Um, so again, a reason for really studying this kind of broader cross-section of, um, of assets. And also in our setting here, where we focus on individual stocks that um, are really trade in this parallel market for the same security traded in different venues, we can look at differences in firm-specific versus market-wide information um, and how you know, differences in market integration for the same asset are impacted by this impact on, uh, on this change in trading speeds. In our setting, we have price discovery that is likely bidirectional. Of course, a lot of price discovery is happening at the um, primary market, but the secondary market that we have with uh, ChaX is also relevant for, for price discovery. So there is some, some back and forth in, in our um, setting here with the same security in these different markets. Um, so that is also something that is um, interesting in, in our setup here. I see that there are some questions. There were some questions in the chat. So maybe I'll just take a break here if there's something. Is there something? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank. Thanks for presenting this very interesting context, and and this is, it sounds like very interesting paper. I I wanted to to flag to you um, a paper that um, my co-authors and I presented in the series in the series a couple of years ago. A paper with uh, Tom Ernst and Jonathan Sokobin. We 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 looked we looked at. Uh, issues of latency in the in, a, in the U.S. context, off exchange and on exchange, and in particular, so so that would also be a context um, um, that that would that would also be a context in which um, uh, uh, trade trading would be occurring at different places, and that was a context actually in which there were sort of differential lags because of how the uh, because because of how the reporting uh, occur occurs. And um, you know, and in particular, the the trade reporting off exchange is occurring through data center is uh, occurring through the data data centers at various locations in New Jersey, uh, depend, depending upon the specifics of the mm -hmm. securities. Um, and one of our so so I guess two points I would highlight. So one is even though it's sort of not only a single market context, it is and it and it isn't because. Um, because got the off exchange trading and the off exchange trading is happening through multiple data centers. Um, and the other point that I would highlight is that latency influences the location of actual price discovery. So one thing, one, one, cha one challenge that that creates, at, at least in our context, um, is that the price discovery isn't, isn't always happening where one econometrically thinks that it's happening um, because of differences in lags. So anyway, I just wanted to flag those issues to you. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure. Exactly how that that relates to your to your to your analysis, but I know since I know you're not familiar with our paper, um, I wanted to flag this to you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. I, I will take a look and, and see how that um, you know is something that we can also consider or at least uh, you know build upon and, and the motivation of our paper or in the interpretation of our results. Uh, I think I have to take a look. I'm not really all that familiar, but thank you. So uh, Christian has responded to the questions in the chat. Uh, so uh, I think you can continue and uh, uh, until, uh, to your next uh, question break. Okay, thank you. Um, so no theoretical model that we're aware of, at least, uh, directly maps to our setting. But I've said that I'm going to talk more about Joseph, Joseph's paper um, because we think that that model comes closest kind of to our empirical setting. Not perfectly. So we're going to translate this a little bit um, to our setting to drive testable hypotheses. In the case of uh, liquidity, so we're going to make some predictions regarding price impacts and um, spreads. But in the paper, we also look at other dimensions of market quality, like efficiency, volatility, price discovery, where the model doesn't give us direct translations, but we still think that it kind of fits the general theme of what we're doing here. Um, and um, it's also impacted by all of the economics that we can learn from, from this model. 
So I'm just going to very briefly walk you through this model. Since it's not our model, um, Josh can maybe check if our understanding of this model is correct and if it really maps to our empirical setting in a reasonable way. Um, so I'm just going to quickly do this, but not spend too much time on this. Um, so in, in this model, we have a single security uh, with an at least initially unknown value. It's traded at different venues, but these venues are identical um, and operate as limit order books. And then a liquidity trader or an information trader you know, with some probability enters the scene and trades one share um, using an immediate or cancel order. The liquidity trader will only trade at the home venue and the information trader is more sophisticated in that sense and will trade at all venues. In addition to these two players, we also have two types of HFT traders. We have at least two HFT market makers. Um, this is so that we have competition, competitive market making among the market makers. Um, so only one of them is going to be active, but there is going to be this competitive pressure from the, uh, from the other HFT market maker. And then we have an infinite number of high frequency snipers. The uh, market makers use post only orders, so they can fill up the uh, order book. And then the snipers use immediate or cancel orders like the um, liquidity trader and the information trader. In this framework, time is discrete, moving, at, moving along at these small increments epsilon. And we have some latency, and this is going to be important in our context, of course, as well. As well. We have latency, and additionally, we have this jitter. Um, so latency is random. It's either one epsilon or three epsilon. That is the time that it takes from submitting an order or cancellation until it is processed by the exchange. If two messages arrive at the same time, then these ties are broken randomly. And this setup gets us to three different Cases. In the first case, we have a liquidity trader that arrives. In the second and third case, we have an information trader that arrives, again, you know, with certain probabilities. The liquidity trader will submit an order to trade at the home venue, because that's the only place where she trades. And the trade then is going to execute either at one epsilon or at three epsilon. And the market maker will then, after this trade, cancel all quotes. After observing this, uh, this trade, um, well, if the trade happens at one epsilon, then the market maker will submit this cancellation order, um, send this to the uh, venues at, at one epsilon, and will get executed either at two epsilon or four epsilon, or alternatively, well, if the trade executes at three epsilon, then um, everything happens um, two epsilons later. So this is all nice for the market maker. Um, all quotes get canceled after some time. Um, after this one initial trade, then the market maker earns the half spread and an expectation of the setup. But then we have these other two cases where the information trader arrives, trades at, uh, submits an order at, um, at zero epsilon, and then, well, it again, either gets executed at one epsilon or three epsilon. Um, but in this second case here, we're going to only look at those cases where exactly one trade executes at, at one epsilon. Remember the information trade is trading on all of these trading venues, so submitting orders to all of these um, venues. And one trade, exactly one trade, is going to execute at one um, epsilon, after which the market maker is going to submit a cancellation message to, um, to all these venues. And the sniper is going to um, remain inactive that we have in this uh, setting here. The sniper will not uh, do anything because up until here, the sniper cannot uh, distinguish between the first case and that, that second case. Now to epsilon, some of the cancellations that the market maker submits to these venues are going to get uh, processed, um, and some of them would only get processed at four epsilon. At three epsilon, the sniper realizes that this has to be an information trader and is going to submit trades uh, orders to all of these um, exchanges. and. Um, those that would, you know, because of the latency execute at six epsilon will be faced with an empty order book. But at least, you know, one sniper's orders, remember we have infinitely many snipers in this model here, will get executed um, at four epsilon. And because we have infinitely many, one of them will be executed before the cancellation of the, um, of the market maker. Remember that it ties are, you know, um, broken randomly. So in this case, um, the sniper profits and the market maker loses, well, at least uh, um, kind of these, uh, at this venue here. Then we have the third case where, um, again, we have the information trader, uh, but now we're going to assume that at one epsilon, 
multiple trades execute. So the sniper sees these trades and immediately infers the information. It's going to submit orders to all venues. The market maker still tries to cancel these um, these quotes at one epsilon, um, but at two epsilon, you know, one sniper's order again infinitely many of them will get get processed at every venue almost surely before um, the market maker cancellation will get processed. So again, the snipers, um, they profit and the market maker loses. So in the first case, the market maker makes a profit. In the second case, um, the market maker makes a loss. At least the subset of exchanges and that uh, in this third case here, the market maker loses out um, on all of these exchanges, trading venues that we have in this model. Now, of course, this setup doesn't perfectly align with our setting. And I think now is a good time to highlight maybe some of the differences that we have in our empirical setting to this theoretical model. Of course, we don't have several identical venues. We only have two of them and they're not identical. We have uh, et cetera and JX. Et cetera is the larger exchange. It's the primary listing exchange for all of these stocks. It's more important for price discovery. It's generally more liquid, more trading activity. And also it's closer geographically to other important marketplaces, for example, for derivatives on these same stocks that you can trade at, et cetera. Um, another difference is that um, the model has, well, at least two market makers and infinitely many HFT snipers. Our setting has slow traders, traditional HFTs, and fast HFTs. So slow traders or basically any other trader. Traditional HFTs may rely on fiber optics, so they are still somewhat fast competing on speed, but they're not using the microwave link. And then we have fast HFTs. And this difference between these you know, different types of HFTs, that mostly matters on checks, not exclusively, but there it's more important. Again, because for example, a lot of the price discovery is happening in Frankfurt for German stocks. That's where we have a lot of information being generated, for example, because of these other exchanges that we have there. Now, in our empirical setting, we're going to focus on this change in fast HFTs, you know, from a smaller number of subscribers to or owners of a microwave link to a larger number. Um, so they're more fast, really fast HFTs. And we're, you know, in our analysis, we're kind of going to lump together these slower traders and traditional HFTs, which are also at least slower than these fast HFTs in our um, sample. So again, there has have been links before, we don't know exactly how many HFTs were active on these um, links, but it has to be a relatively small number based on kind of the public information that we could find, and also based on um, other like studies. Um, kind of in um, GB, I've mentioned the paper before. Um, they look at some microwave licenses, and it has to be a really low number. So only very few traders were active um, before. Um, so it is an increase in the number of fast HFTs that is, uh, that is meaningful. Still, the number of snipers that we can potentially have in this setting is going to be, of course, limited. It's not an infinite number of, uh, of snipers. Um, still, we think that kind of the implications and the intuitions that we can gain from that model of having fewer snipers, um, that is still kind of an intuitive translation to what we have in our empirical setup. So I need to make two premises when it comes to, um, to kind of translating this model. The first is that um, indeed the new microwave link increased the number and activity of these fast HFTs. And I think this makes sense because um, if the network simply replaced the existing network or you know everybody jumped on that network because it may or may not have been um, a marginal, um, marginally better, um, when it comes to, to speed, then we would not expect a substantial effect. Um, so I think this, this is unlikely, especially given the second observation that we have, that is um, that micro networks are typically very much capacity constrained. So the CEO of that company uh, mentions that um, the capacity of fiber networks is at a thousand times that of a wireless network. So you really have to think carefully about what you're going to send on that microwave link, uh, which information, which orders are you going to uh, send over that link. I've said, in the, uh, in the introduction that um, the capacity for an individual trader um, or subscriber to that link was 10 megabits. Um, just to kind of put this in perspective for what we have in single venue um, operations, um, Bjorn has a paper, um, an RFS paper on the uh, collocation upgrades. And I think in, in that setting, there is a basic collocation package, a premium package and a 10G package. Um, and um, 10G, 10 gigabit is, um, well, that is a 
thousand times that of what we have for an individual subscriber to that microwave link. And apparently there was a business case for upgrading from something that is in the premium package, which I don't know exactly, but I assume it's a one gigabit. Um, so a hundred times that capacity of the, uh, the bandwidth of the microwave link to a thousand times. Um, so there was that business case for upgrading. Um, so you know, if you just have a 10 megabit connection, in our case, it is probably pretty limited as to what you can actually transmit. So you have to think hard about what you can do and you can't do everything. You cannot do market making on all of these stocks. Uh, so you have to be somewhat selective. You have to prioritize, um, which brings me to, um, to this observation here that only this, this uh, um, conjecture really. Um, so if there was only a kind of small number of fast HFTs active in the market, then HFTs likely focus on large caps, you know, consistent with prior evidence that we have and large caps being more actively traded. So we can probably make higher profits there. But if there's already a high number of really fast HFTs in that market for that stock, then you need to decide what to do. Are you going to uh, to compete with this really large number of fast HFTs that is there already, or do you do something else? Um, and that something else could be either you move to a different stock, or maybe you engage in sniping activity and thus um, um, impose adverse selection costs. So this is where we come to this difference between large caps and mid caps. Um, so we think it's feasible that uh, we have some some empirical evidence to that end that. Um, in large caps, the profits that you can make from market making are probably already pretty much exploited by the incumbent fast HFTs, these private networks that were there before. Um, in the model, you just need two fast market makers to reach these competitive um, spreads. And then new fast HFTs that enter the scene have this incentive to become snipers if they want to you know, be active in large caps. And that would impose adverse selection costs on these other high frequency trading market makers. Now, given minimum tick sizes and these reward frictions that we have, quoted spreads in response may not necessarily um, widen because maybe these spreads weren't at the competitive level without tick constraints beforehand, but realized spreads may decrease. Um, so that gives us a couple of hypotheses, this line of reasoning, and that is that um, in large caps, where we already have some fast HFTs, we would expect a price an increase in the price impact at checks at this more kind of... Uh, remote um, exchange, we would expect that quoted or effective spreads, the model, um, and, and we don't really distinguish in, in our reasoning there, um, would increase and or realized spreads decrease. That depends a bit on kind of minimum tick sizes where we expect the, the action to be. And we would expect similar effects, at etc., but probably a bit smaller, given that this is where more of the information is generated. And then if we look at mid caps, um, well, the reasoning is somewhat different and the um, predictions that we make is, is different because we would expect that market making, um, there, there's still some profits that you can make from market making in mid caps. So there's less adverse selection risk if you're really fast HFT now in mid caps. So what do you do? Um, you know, maybe a bit more competition there, you're offering um, smaller spreads, quoted or effective, um, or you're earning higher rents from, from market making. There may be some snipers, um, but probably they would not offset this, these, these profits that you can gain from market making if you're really fast in, uh, in mid caps, so they're not offsetting this. So kind of consistent with the model because there you only need two HFT market makers, um, but infinitely many uh, snipers. So we would expect to have a lower price impact after the introduction of that link in mid caps at ChiX um, and a decrease in, uh, in, in spreads um, quoted effective spreads and increase in, in realized spreads. And again, we expect something similar, et cetera, um, but maybe a bit smaller. Are there any, uh, any questions? Uh, yes, Stefan, there are a couple of questions in, in the chat. Let's see if uh, uh, Peter and Chester, do you want to raise your hands? Then we can uh, uh, activate your microphones. Chester was faster on doing that, so you go first. Well, not I'm I'm not always faster, but in any case, um, so so why why is it obvious to focus attention on large on large cap? Um, I would have thought um, there would be less attention and therefore less competition on 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 small cap. And you know, if I had access to superior technology, I might want to I might want to 
uh, focus focus my efforts there. Maybe maybe even on a large number of stocks there, but where there was less competition. Yeah, so so I, I think this is at least what I meant to say. So if you're kind of the the first user of a micro network, kind of the, these private networks, then likely what you're doing is you're focusing on large caps. Um, but uh, you know, if you already have a number of market makers that are active in uh, in large caps and market making becomes less profitable due to you know, competition, then to me, it seems plausible that, well, you either think about other stocks to uh, to go to, um, like smaller stocks, for example, or you engage not in market making, um, but in other activities such as sniping. So does, does your empirical design try to sort that out? Um, we don't exactly know who was using or how many HFTs were using the link the, these private networks before. Right? We have some rough estimates of there were like two different networks, but in any case, this new network that was introduced has to kind of increase the number of fast HFTs relative to before. And given the capacity constraints that you have, um, these fast HFTs that were active beforehand were doing something, probably market making in large cap stocks is what we're you know, conjecturing based on these observations. It, it, it just seems like you want to think more, 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 more about if, if you if you're going to emphasize the splitting of the sample, you you want to think more um, ab about how to really kind of drill drill down on that. I would, you know, in the summary statistics that we have in the, in the cross section when we look at, for example, you know, press impacts and, and price you know, to cover to some extent. Uh, we can see a lot of things that are consistent with uh, with, uh, with with this um, to getting together with. I, but yeah, I, 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 I get I get your point. Uh, we'll, we'll take it. Sure. I thank you, uh, Peter. Oh, uh, let me uh, skip uh, for the sake of time. Uh, uh, Stefan can read my comment uh, in the chat. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and maybe during the Q&A, we can then talk about this. Okay. Uh, okay. With that, I think we can continue. Okay, so let me very briefly introduce our empirical approach. So we do this in a, as you may have guessed, in a difference and difference um, setting where we look at two months before and two months after October, where we exclude October um, to allow for you know subscribers to become active and set up their operations and you know subscribe to that link. Um, we compare these German stocks, which is our treatment group, to the French stocks, our control group. They were located in London, so they shouldn't be directly impacted by the uh, by the microwave link. We split into mid and large caps. We've tried other splits as well, like for example, index membership. And um, I mean, obviously, that's very highly correlated with the uh, market cap, but it doesn't make much of a difference. Uh, we have data on Chex and the uh, two primary markets. Data comes from uh, Bedofi or Fidai. It's at one millisecond resolution, um, but these measures are going to be aggregated to a data frequency. And I'm going to show you different, different results for um, just you know, chi X comparing German stocks to French stocks before and after the microwave link at chi X, then at the primary market. But I also have some statistics on cross market um, estimations for things like arbitrage and information shares, where I, of course, need both of these trading values. So let me first show you some uh, validation of kind of using this um, this introduction of the link. Um, so we do find that it's meaningful in the sense that the duration of arbitrage opportunities here in, in milliseconds that decreases for German stocks, but happens for both uh, uh, significantly for both uh, mid caps and large caps. It's a bit stronger for mid caps, but um, in any case, we have this, this, uh, this reduction in the duration for French stocks, not really all that much uh, happening. We have a reduction in the number of arbitrage opportunities, again, for both mid-cap stocks and large-cap stocks, and also in the uh, value of these arbitrage opportunities. Now, the uh, value here um, in uh, euros per day per stock may seem a bit low initially, at least that was my uh, impression when I first uh, you know, generated these numbers. Um, but uh, keep in mind that this is really a very kind of uh, the, the simplest type of arbitrage that you can do. So we look at times where the consolidated book is crossed, and then the theoretical kind of profits that you could make from resolving these uh, arbitrage opportunities. So the maximum difference that you have when the um, consolidated book is um, is crossed. And then it, it shows that the event does reduce the profitability of, of market making. But keep in mind that there are also other 
types of arbitrage that you can do that we're not really capturing here. So simple things like so simple versions of statistical arbitrage um, that you can do uh, where you have very simple algorithms that are still you know feasible within these two milliseconds of gain that you uh, have as a subscriber to the uh, to the microwave link. Um, so um, that is, in that sense, probably more of a lower bound as to the things that you can do with, uh, with this new microwave link. We then look at the impact on uh, trading activity, and we find that um, there is a, you know, looking first at uh, the um, mid caps here at ChaX, there is a um, you know, marginally significant reduction in the number of trades at ChaX. Um, similar for the trading volume at checks and mid caps for large caps, the effect is larger in magnitude and also uh, significance. We don't find an effect on average trade sizes at CHIX. And then if we look at the primary market and compare um, what is going on in, in the German stocks to the French stocks there, we find that um, well, nothing much is changing um, there. There is a slight increase in trading volume in large caps at uh, the primary market um, and so our trade sizes get a little bit bigger in mid caps at the primary market. So we can take these findings together and interpret them because they're consistent with um, some kind of reduced order splitting across venues. Um, so um, we see fewer trades um, at ChaX, so it seems like some of this is kind of migrating to the primary market, maybe because of changes in kind of ad hoc selection or changes in um, vanishing liquidity that you as a slower trader may have given the kind of increased activity of um, very fast high frequency traders. Quoting activity. We look at the number of messages that change the best bid and offer at the respective exchanges and those that don't, that are deeper in the book, um, find results that are kind of consistent with uh, what I've just said. Um, there is some kind of crowding out of activity on um, Chai X after the you know, increased activity of really fast uh, traders at Chai X. Um, we find that for both mid and large caps, but a bit stronger for the large caps, there's a reduction in the number of messages that change the best bid and offer and you know, weaker results, but still for um, lower in the book, at least for large caps. At the primary market, there's an overall sort of increase in the message activity. So again, that is consistent with um, you know, some traders kind of being crowded out of checks and moving to the, uh, to the primary market. In that case, they probably the, the kind of slower traders. Um, and slower market makers. Our setup allows us to look at differences in market-wide versus stock-specific information. We do this in a relatively simple setup where we regress the returns that we observe, um, the mid-quote returns that we observe at CHAX on returns that um, are happening at the primary market. So this is just for the German stocks um, and on returns in um, the DAX futures, so the kind of market-wide um, index futures, to see if there's a shift maybe away from market information to stock-specific information after the introduction of that link. And we do find evidence that is, um, that is consistent with, um, with this. So we see here in the kind of dark red for mid caps, but also for large caps, um, an increase in the relevancy of the information coming from the primary market relative to before. And I mean, this looks small, but it's statistically significant, a decrease in the relevance of um, market-wide information as given by the returns of um, index futures. We have that for both mid caps and large caps. Now notice that some of the information here seems to be faster than theoretically possible, the speed of light, uh, but this is probably because you know, some traders will um, simultaneously, will submit orders so that they simultaneously arrive at multiple venues. So just by that token, you will always have um, orders that appear to arrive uh, faster than they theoretically could based on, uh, on the speed of light. We then look at information shares. We use Joe Hasbrook's uh, high resolution information shares where we compare the price discovery at the primary market to price discovery at um, CHIX. And generally we find that there is a substantial decrease in the information share of the primary market, so et cetera, for mid caps, so um, from 86 to 73% for, um, for the German 
mid caps and in the French stocks, there's not really all that much happening. Uh, so this is highly relevant and highly statistically significant. For the large caps, we don't find a change in the information share um, when it comes to prime member market versus um, CHAX. So in the mid cap stocks, this increased participation of fast HFTs um, does contribute to press discovery. But uh, for the large cap stocks, it seems like um, CHAX was already relatively highly integrated probably due to higher levels of HFT, HFT activity of those that already were using these um, proprietary networks that um, were there before. I have two more dimensions of market quality that I briefly want to, I want to discuss. Um, one is liquidity and the other one is going to be volatility and market efficiency. Before I show you the results um, and the regression framework for, market, for, for uh, liquidity, um, maybe it's instructive to kind of look at these graphs and the development um, over time. What you can see is that um, here we have effective spreads for large caps, this uh, column here, and mid caps, this column here, and then checks at the top and the primary market at the bottom. You see that, uh, well, firstly, generally, these spreads tend to co-move between German stocks and French stocks relatively well. Um, but what immediately strikes the eye is this massive decrease in effective spreads that we have for mid caps at CHAX, um, you know, relative to what is going on in the French stocks and CHAX. And to some extent, we also have this at the primary market um, for mid caps. We observe similar patterns when it comes to here price impact, for example, that uh, before the event, there was a higher level and relatively constant level at, uh, at CHAX. And then during October, as people were starting to subscribe to, uh, to this link, we see this, this improvement in liquidity, especially in mid caps at X, but there are also other changes that are somewhat difficult to see here because I put them all on the same scale. So we can look at this in a regression setup. And we do find evidence that is consistent with these predictions that we derive from, uh, from the model as, uh, as discussed earlier. So remember our hypothesis for uh, the mid caps is that price impacts decrease. So there's less adverse selection um, quoted and effective spreads, they go down and or realized spreads go up. And we do find evidence that is uh, exactly consistent with this for the mid caps. You can see that there is a substantial decrease in price impact um, and adverse selection costs at CHAX for these German stocks, as I've seen, as I've shown you in the graph, um, and a substantial decrease in effective spreads at CHAX um, whereas we don't see much um, realized spreads. So all of that is consistent with, uh, with our hypotheses of um, you know, these additional fast traders making markets, reducing adverse selection costs, um, you know, being better able to protect against adverse selection using their fast link at CHAX. In the primary market, we find similar effects, but they're, as we expected, a bit weaker. In the paper, we also do kind of like a triple diff to um, say something about the statistical magnitude of this. In the large cap stocks, the hypotheses were somewhat reversed. Um, so there we expect a higher price impact and um, higher quoted and effective spreads um, or a, a lower realized spread. And exactly um, kind of going with these predictions that what we find, we find a substantial increase in adverse selection in these large cap stocks at uh, chi x, a decrease in realized spreads. In that case, the effective spread um, well, increases, but not statistically um, significant. And the results that we have um, at the primary market are somewhat similar, but here we don't observe a, um, an increase, at least not statistically significant, in adverse selection costs. Um, but still, we have a slight decrease in realized spreads. Very briefly, um, volatility and price efficiency, which we measure by absolute autocorrelations, um, just give us kind of the same, uh, the same picture. Um, the model doesn't give us any clear predictions with respect to uh, these dimensions of market quality, um, but it's still important to kind of look at the implications of intermarket latency on these dimensions. And we've had results that are somewhat in line with what we find for liquidity in the sense that market quality improves substantially for the mid caps at CHAX. So we see this huge reduction in volatility for mid cap stocks at CHAX. For the large cap stocks, we don't really find um, any strong effects. Um, similarly, for absolute autocorrelation or measure of um, market um, inefficiency, 
that decreases. So we observe a substantial increase in price efficiency in these mid-cap stocks at uh, ChaiX. At the primary market, where everything, um, we, all these changes generally were, uh, were smaller, we don't find any strong impacts on market quality. There's some evidence of a decrease in price efficiency in large cap stocks at the primary market, but this result isn't terribly robust if I use different measures of market uh, efficiency, like um, variance ratios, for example, that disappears. So I don't want to over um, stretch the interpretation of, uh, of this coefficient here. We do some additional tests. Um, I think maybe most importantly, we also look at the European consolidated books, so kind of the EBBO. Um, we do find that trading activity taken together is not really impacted all that heavily um, by the introduction of the microwave link. So there's some you know, reshifting from one venue to the other, in particular from ChaX to the primary market um, in, in many cases. But in the aggregate, there doesn't seem to be a huge, uh, huge effect on that. Um, Looking at the consolidated book at the EBBO, we do find um, mostly the same results as for like looking at these individual venues as I've shown you. Um, so there is evidence of increased snapping activity or higher adverse selection costs in large caps. Um, there is a reduction in price impacts um, and spreads for, for mid caps, um, even at the consolidated book level. I think the major difference is that at the consolidated book level, we don't find this um, effect on, um, on aggregate volatility. Um, so that tends to disappear at the EBBO. But still, in Europe, it's not like everybody that is trading is trading on all of these venues. So that may be different from other places like the, uh, like the US for the most part. Uh, so here we have a lot of traders that are just you know, active on, on one exchange. So even um, though, for example, volatility may not change at the EBBO, this is still really relevant for somebody that is only trading at, uh, at ChaiX that we have this improvement in market quality, at least for mid caps at uh, ChaiX. So let me conclude. Um, we do find um, evidence that is consistent with this um, you know, notion that the level of um, incumbent HFT activity, very fast traders in a market, um, um, you know, that depends on. So sorry, the the effect of this shock to to latency that depends on um, the competitiveness of market making um, in in these stocks. So with this cross section of um, assets that, that we have in large caps, it is likely that new fast HFTs um, increase after selection costs, at least that's consistent with uh, kind of the, the evidence that we, uh, that we find. Um, in mid cap stocks, we do find that liquidity uh, improves. Um, there were probably still some gains to be made from market making. Um, so it seems like new market uh, participants use this network to, um, to make markets um, instead of sniping activity. Uh, and that comes with an increase in, in market quality. So the introduction of this new fast connection between trading venues, that doesn't seem to be um, unambiguously good or bad. It's a bit more nuanced than that. Um, a small number of fast liquidity providers can be good, but if we increase it too much, then uh, that may be harmful to liquidity because of this kind of sniping activity. Um, and as a side note, um, this um, effect that we find um, that there is no overall increase in trading volume suggests that even though ChaiX becomes you know, more competitive, better liquidity, more contribution to price um, discovery, it doesn't seem like the venue itself is, well, the venue operator is benefiting much from this increase because we have at the same time fewer messages and lower trading volume at that venue. Uh, so with that, I conclude. Thank you very much. I look forward to, uh, to some questions that you may uh, still have or comments. Thanks a lot, Stefan. Uh, before we open up the, the Q&A, let me uh, advertise the, the next talk uh, in uh, TME. It will be by uh, Maureen O'Hara uh, in two weeks on the 28th of October. And um, as I mentioned in the beginning, for, uh, uh, for everyone in the, in the US, it will be at the same time as usual. But for the uh, Europeans, for example, it will be an hour earlier uh, due to daylight saving uh, issues. Um, uh, so we have uh, many hands uh, up. Uh, uh, maybe uh, still I, I can begin because I posted the question in, in the chat here and I'll give the background uh, for that question. Uh, I uh, thought back at the paper by Andre, uh, Shkilko and Sokolov. Um, they, um, discussed this issue with the limited bandwidth of the microwave network 
and uh, uh, I think they, if I remember correctly, they reason that um, uh, the limited bandwidth uh, leads uh, to the rationale that it's primarily used for arbitrage rather than for for market making. And uh, that is in line with their finding of uh, reduced uh, market quality. Um, so um, uh, that, uh, with that in mind, I had the question, if you looked at uh, the arbitrage opportunity, opportunities, if they tend to be uh, closed uh, by a trade uh, more often than before, uh, that would be a sign that uh, arbitrageurs uh, get an upper hand with this speed upgrade. Mm -hmm. It's on the other hand, more often closed by uh, quote revision, it is a, a sign of higher relative speed of the market makers. Mm -hmm. This is an excellent point. Um, I think some years ago, we kind of started looking into this, um, but I don't quite remember. So I think I have, uh, I have some... Um, some results somewhere on like how these arbitrage opportunities get closed. Um, so right now we're only using this to kind of validate um, that something happened around this uh, this uh, the introduction of this link. Um, but I would have to you know take another look and maybe that would allow us to kind of better um, see what exactly these uh, these traders are doing. Um, so frankly, I, I don't I don't know, but we I guess I we can look at this. Thank you. Okay, uh, then uh, PK is first in line with the question. Thank you. Yeah, so I think to get a more complete picture, uh, uh, like Chester mentioned off exchange, but also derivatives, right? Like, so if the stock options are uh, being hedged, they would mainly be looking at the settlement prices on et cetera, right? Instead of the Kayex. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess so. Because yeah, and given that oh. that uh, etc. and Eurex are both kind of in Frankfurt near Frankfurt, we don't expect there to be much of a change in that relationship um, between uh, after the introduction of the link. Um, mm -hmm. But but uh, to the extent, I think it's important at least as a control variable because then you get a little bit more complete picture in terms of what who exactly is arbitraging and some of it this may be driven by the hedging activity. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, Albert? It's so fun. Um, very interesting. Uh, I was hoping somebody would look at this, uh, at this uh, event that uh, uh, Smart Railway Network was produced and then uh, it was um, rented out by um, so, so many um, uh, who wanted to use it to uh, get first, first access to London. Um, I'm a little, a little bit puzzled by why you keep talking about latency being the dominant uh, driver here, because then you're in competition with so many good papers out there. Whereas what you really have here is that um, it's 10, uh, in fact, I mean, I, I had c connection issues because I was on the train, uh, but I, I think what you have here is that you had 10 people uh, essentially put on the same speed um, uh, of course, it's a example at the exact same speed that might be in um, do, do, Is that would that be a, um, a the right way to think about this, or do you think that really the dot force is the latency increase? And so you kind of cut off with the the last part before you ask that that question. You have ten people that. So you have 10, 10 people uh, that have um, that that are of course uh, put on a faster connection to Kayaks in London, but the but the, uh, but the, the, the real uh, interesting thing is that these pe people are put at equal speeds, and there's no dispersion, uh, there's no tiny dispersion in uh, in their latencies, and that yeah. in and of itself is an interesting observation that hasn't been studied before. And I would see the novelty of your your research relative to what Chester mentioned and other people have mentioned. Bjorn mentioned Andre's uh, great paper. I mean, there's so many nice papers out there, but but this is how I would uh, see your study as differentiating from the others. But mm -hmm. you're not seeing it that way because you emphasize latency. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, this very interesting point. Um, I mean, unfortunately, we don't have trader IDs in our settings, so that would be really cool if we could, you know, identify these these ten and they have exactly the same. Um, the same 
latency. Um, so we, we interpreted this not just as an, a shock to average latency. So what we, we're making the case that um, we have, before the introduction of the link, we have very few fast HFTs. And then after this introduction, we have more, but there's still slower traders out there. Um, so that is kind of the, the, the shock that we see. It's not an on and off of HFT as what you have in, in a lot of studies, um, but it's really this you know, additional competition that you get as an incumbent HFT from these new HFTs that are not subscribers to the link. But I have to think more about this kind of, um, you know, you have these 10, 12 uh, subscribers that have exactly the same kind of settings. Um, I have to think more about that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Andre, next in line. Uh, Stefan, thank you for uh, a, a very exciting talk. You showed a figure, I can't remember the slide, maybe around slide 20, um, with reaction, yeah, that one. Um, with I think these are reaction times to information arrivals. Yeah. Um, and if I and I, I only had a second to think about it, but it looks like the mid caps and the large caps before the introduction of this link were reacting pretty much at the same time, unless I'm misreading um, this figure. Um, uh the, the pickup seems to be around three millis. If these are milliseconds, then it would be about three milliseconds for both groups. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it, how, does that fit with your uh, with the story that you're telling? You mean the story of um, differences in, uh, in in large caps and, and mid caps uh, when it comes to market making and sniping? Um, so. I mean, this doesn't really kind of tell us how this tells us what type of information they're trading on. Um, so for both set for both the mid caps and large caps, we find that uh, you know sp stock specific information becomes more relevant. It doesn't really tell us much about um, how this information is incorporated. Is this you know quote adjustments, or is this due to you know sniping activity and and, and trades that may be different you know between these kind of two markets. Um, so I think a lot of the kind of results that we have are still you know, plausible, even with this um, similar increase that we have around um, three um, milliseconds here. When we do find, um, and there is some difference in this kind of cross-section here, that generally there is, you know, these coefficients are generally speaking larger for the large caps, right? So there's more information even at kind of like three or four milliseconds um, that comes from uh, comes from the the other venue in, in large caps, especially when you look at um, the information that comes from from the futures market, which is more relevant in, in large caps. Um, so it seems like there was more information being used that is generated in Frankfurt um, in chi X in large caps than in, than in mid caps, even though kind of at the kind of top speed here, uh, three milliseconds, which is really what we expect to see uh, to see these effects. Um, we have something happening in both mid caps and large caps, but you know, if you look at kind of what, how much information is, is incorporated in large caps, that is still larger in these large caps than in the mid caps. So there's some heterogeneity in the cross section along these uh, along these lines. Not one hundred percent sure that answers your question, though. I was I was thinking that it might make more sense to instead of looking at large caps versus mid caps, given that there is some evidence that fast connections were used in mid caps, at least from what I'm seeing. Um, maybe you guys could go stock by stock or instance by instance. If traders are selectively using them when it makes the most sense, then it could potentially make sense to go a little bit deeper into individual securities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, good point. Um, so. Mm -hmm. We have done this large cap mid cap split. We have looked at other splits um, like. Um, index membership, but at some point also tick constraint and the results generally are very much similar. Um, so that's what we just looked at this most intuitive way in, in, in the way of looking at this large cap mid caps. Um, I guess um, looking at more of the kind of different characteristics of the stocks or the kind of market environment as to when something is happening that that could make sense. And maybe there is a more heterogeneity than in, in the cross section there as well. Thank you. Thank you. 
Josh. Yeah, thanks uh, for the interesting talk. Um, so, so one thing I was wondering, it, you know, it looks like at, at a high level, what you're looking at is what happens when the number of traders who have microwave speed jumps from two to 12. Okay, but we, we might also wonder, you know, about other changes, um, you know, like if, if the number jumps from say zero to two, or if that number jumps from 12 to 50. Um, and I was wondering if you could maybe help me think through what we might expect there. Like, should we, should we expect the effects to be monotonic? So go in the same direction as what you find uh, or maybe your theoretical framework suggests we should find kind of something else. Um, just can, can you help me think through that? Well, that's a difficult question, <laughs> I, I guess, because to look at all these different cases, uh, I guess we would need to write our own model and just piggyback on yours. Um, so my, my gut feeling tells me that, you know, if you go from two to 12, or if you go from 12 to 50, probably it doesn't make that much of a difference. But of course, that depends on how broad is the cross-section that we're looking at relative to the bandwidth that we're kind of adding with these with these traders. But I guess the competitive dynamics between 12 and 50 probably matter, you know, not more than going from two to 12 or 14 then. Um, what happens if you have one or two or then 12, um, you know, where you go from basically kind of like a monopoly, duopoly, and then you increase competition there? Um, in that sense, oh, I, I would really have to think this this through. So I'm not sure I can give you an answer right now. Um, but uh, it's an interesting question. Maybe something we can uh, probably not add as a model to our, our paper, but maybe think a bit more about um, how that would translate in other settings where we have different uh, competitive dynamics and, and market making. Uh, so we have one more question lined up by Yang. Uh, yeah. Hi. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Stefan, for your presentation. That's a very interesting topic. Um, could you please go to the realized sprite page? The result about the realized sprite. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I wonder that why the realized sprite uh, on average are negative, and even for large caps, they decrease further. And if this is the case, why the uh, fattest uh, high frequency traders, they do not update their codes on large cap stocks using the microwave technology. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I didn't really have time to talk much about this. Uh, you know, just as a sanity check uh, before the presentation, I was also looking at kind of these negative realized uh, spreads. And I mean, this is this is pretty common nowadays to have negative realized uh, spreads in, in markets. Uh, so, for example, I looked at uh, Maureen O'Hara's uh, uh, paper on high frequency market microstructure that is well, almost 10 years ago. Um, and even there, it says that you know, nowadays most of realized spreads are uh, are negative. So this is kind of normal in, in today's market. So uh, you have directional traders where you kind of expect to have a negative realized spreads and others are uh, are near zero. So on average, you would expect to see, uh, you do see these um negative realized uh, spreads. Um, so this is this is not uncommon. I guess this is just a kind of market environment that we have nowadays. Um, not sure if this fully uh, answers your question. Uh, uh, no, it didn't, because uh, she writes in the chat now, what does it measure then? Um, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I'll... Uh, Yang, if you want to uh, speak up, please raise your hand again, then I can uh, unmute you. So sorry, I forgot, I forgot. Yeah, Andrew mentioned this. Uh, yeah, so what does it measure then? Because realize that's right, measure the runs of the market makers, right? If, they, if it doesn't really measure the profit made by market maker, then why do you show this? I don't think there is a point of of really showing this measure. Right. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Christian. You want you want to quickly jump in because I know you've thought more about uh, about this point. Um, yeah, I, I I think I think uh, previously in you know, old days, realizers right should measure the profit made by market makers. It also reflect the run the rent made by market makers. Then, if multiple or more high frequency traders flock flock into the mid-cap stocks, then we would expect the realizer spread for that stocks decrease. 
And maybe the assumption is that previously it was a com competitive, right? I'm not very sure. So my question actually is, what does it really measure now that is the real life spread? Why they are on average negative? Um, I, I think realized spreads in, a, in such a study are always some some average over what market makers earn as rents to the limit orders and the losses incurred by directional limit order traders. And so uh, if we want to interpret our coefficients as a reduction in the market makers' rents, then of mm -hmm. course we need to assume that there's no systematic change to the losses that directional traders make. And so presumably these directional traders um, are slow regardless of whether the counterparties uh, trade via microwave or via uh, fiber. And so if you can make that assumption, then the differential effect we observe here in the different diff um, can be attributed uh, to the market makers. Okay, 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 thank you. Yeah. Better, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so uh, I see uh, no more hands at the moment, but we do have a question uh, in the chat from Stefan Schlamp uh, from Eurex. Uh, I, I guess Stefan had to disconnect, so why don't we take up his question and he can listen to it at the in the recording later. Um, so if the owners of the private microwave links had been exploiting all arbitrage opportunities, then the added competition should not have changed anything other than splitting the pie into more pieces. So if the 10 new entrants did have an impact, this su suggests that the originally fastest participants were capacity constraint, constrained, right? I would agree, yes. <laughs> Um, we we do find that uh, that even before this introduction, there were you know arbitrage opportunities that were clearly not exploited, and that number goes down after the introduction of the link, showing us that of course these are not the same situations, right? But you know uh, if, if there are no other changes, which we assume that there's no reason for 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 not, um, then clearly these were exploitable with the additional bandwidth and these additional traders that then entered the scene with uh, the new microwave link. So. I, I, would, I would agree. That's a good point that uh, maybe we can you know, use this as kind of additional evidence of how original traders were, uh, were capacity constrained. Um, I think we should add uh, one thing here that is why these are arbitrage opportunities, they're clearly not riskless. So yeah. by the time you submit your audit, you don't know whether you're going to be able to exploit the opportunity. So that's why some opportunities will remain unexploited. Uh, because the risk is perceived as being too high uh, by the snipers. Good. Uh, so if there are no more questions, uh, let's thank uh, Stefan and also Christian for giving this nice paper. And uh, thank you also everyone for, for coming to the Microstructure Exchange. And uh, uh, I wish you a, a great day and see you next time. Thank you. Thanks.